to being drawn And families torn at the seams It's getting harder and harder to see What any of this means When hate is having its day And children are shot in the street Sometimes there's no way Death has lost its sting Why are things so broken? Again and again we pray Where has all the mercy gone? The writing's on the wall We just wish that we could sleep we want to close our eyes We're not who we want to be We look in the mirror And we don't like the face that we find We pray that you are listening God forgive us one more time Why are things so broken? Christian Church. Um, if you are joining us on Facebook or YouTube, uh, we are located in Winterville, North Carolina, and we are glad that you are here with us this morning. My name is Rich Freeland, and I am the pastor here at Winterville Christian Church. Uh, Winterville Christian Church is affiliated with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, uh, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. We are an anti-racism and pro-reconciliation -reconcil pro tradition. Uh, this congregation has also chosen to be a green chalice congregation, which just means that we are uh, striving to be good stewards of the earth. We are in covenant concerning the environment. Uh, we are also an open and affirming church. Uh, we are a small but diverse congregation, and we welcome and extend full participation to the LGBTQIA community. We also welcome and affirm people of all races and all beliefs. As Rob Bell says, the gospel is only good news if it is good news for everyone. So this morning, um, we start off, as always, with some joys and concerns. Um, you all have been very lax at sharing joys with me. I don't have any joy. There's no joy this morning, apparently. It's sunny all weekend. <laughs> it is. It's a beautiful weekend, yes, and that is certainly a joy. Uh, spring is seems quickly approaching. We have some beautiful daffodils outside, and, um, and the weather has been great. Um, birthdays. We have some birthdays coming up this week. Um, on the 11th, 
Sharon Worthington celebrates a birthday. On March 12th, Jansen Bonds and Stacy Mills share a birthday. And I think that is, um, those are our birthdays for the week. No anniversaries. We also, this morning, we bring some concerns. Um, we have, um, well, let's see. So we still continue to pray for uh, those who have been sick with COVID-19, those who have died. Um, we pray that uh, the vaccines will bring our community back to some sense of normalcy. We pray that we will have an attitude of love for one another. I'd like to add this morning, too, that we pray for Jenna Franks, uh, a trans woman who was murdered. And what they had to say about Jenna was that she was a person who suffered from addiction and chronic homelessness. And she had a long road in figuring who she is, and then she was murdered for who she is. We also pray for Emery Robinson. We pray for Ann Lundy, David Gordon of Memorial Baptist Church, Lisa Tedder, who is um, instrumental in keeping this region of the DOC running. We pray for her grandson, Christian. We pray for Churchill Briley, Heather Rollins, Vidalia King, Dottie Yates, Susie Yates Clark, Janice Yanda, Georgia O'Brien, Kara Bramhall. God, we ask you to hear our petitions, to hear our joys, our concerns, and that you would continue to bless us and comfort us and offer us peace, that you will heal those who are in need of healing, and that, you, that we raise these up to you, Lord, so that you can share your love and your peace with us. Amen. If you would join me this morning in our call to worship, which can be found in your order, again and again, we come, come to, to this, this space. space. Again and again, we, we gather, gather as a community. community. Again and again, we move closer to God. And again and again, God, God is here. We are met. We are heard. We are shown the way. So again and again, let us worship the Holy God. This morning our opening hymn is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. This morning, before we read the scripture, um, last week in our call to worship, we spent a little bit of quiet time, and um, I heard that that was something that people had enjoyed, and so I thought we'd spend just a little bit of time um, just kind of centering and feeling into this place. And so uh, I invite you to close your eyes and rest your feet on the floor beneath you. 
and release any tension that you are holding. Tension that might be present in your jaw or your neck, your shoulders, your hands, your legs, your feet. And take a deep breath in and slowly let it out. The Hebrew word for breath is the same word for spirit. So as you breathe, imagine that it is God who is filling up your lungs with energy and love. Trust that God is as close as your very breath. And now I invite you to just still your mind. Imagine your mind as a river. Thoughts drift into view as they always do. However, instead of holding on to those thoughts, allow yourself to let them float by. And listen. The sound of your breath is the sound of the divine this is a holy space. And we pray, Creator God, we don't just want to listen. We want to hear you. We want to read scripture aloud and know that you are as close as you have always been. We want to read scripture aloud and feel your word resonating inside our bones. We want to read scripture aloud and have your words stuck in our heads like a melody, falling off our lips like a love song. Creator God, we don't just want to listen. We want to hear you. So turn our hearts toward you, just as you turn strangers into disciples. Turn our ears toward you, just as you turn tables in the temple. We are listening. Amen. So this morning we read from the Gospel of John, which is um, a change because we've been reading from Mark quite a bit. And we're going to read about Jesus in the temple and overturning tables. and. Uh, I just want to point out to you that this story is present in all the Gospels, but John is the only Gospel where this story occurs at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so in John, um, this is one of the first instances of Jesus uh, being in public and, uh, and you know, at the very beginning of his ministry, while in the others we read this as uh, Jesus is getting closer to death. And so, um, but here in John, this is one of the events that starts Jesus' ministry. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, The temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our response today is the Lord is in his holy temple. Thank you. 
So this has been kind of a heavy few days for me. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but these uh, the Gospels for Lent are kind of heavy. Um, and, uh, and this one has weighed heavy on me for the last couple of days because the only thing I can, I can get from this or, or the thing that is strongest that I hear or that I feel is, is that there is a challenge here. Um, there is a challenge to us and there is a challenge, I think, to Christians across the world. Uh, we, um, we're, we're, we're becoming more and more familiar with, or I don't want to say comfortable with, but riots seem to be a little more common these days than maybe they were uh, several years ago. Uh, people lashing out because of frustration and anger, lashing out because oppression seems to be forever present, lashing out because they feel their rights are being taken or their position in power is slipping away. Lashing out because they feel like they are being pushed, pushed out or excluded. And when these things happen, we say, enough is enough. Or we have to do better. This isn't who we are. And then nothing changes. And we go about our way. We forget the pain of just a day or a few days ago or a week ago. We forget the pain of others. And then the frustration festers and the anger grows and people lash out again. You know, people lash out and turn to violent expressions of their anger and frustration when everything they have tried has failed. I mean, how many people have put together a piece of Ikea furniture? You try and try and then what happens? Frustration, anger, right? Something goes flying across the room. I mean, there is a point where we get so frustrated and so angry that we just lash out. And while IKEA furniture is nothing in comparison to some of the anger and frustration that some people have, we can see it in such a small thing. Imagine, imagine being so frustrated with a system that has oppressed you so tired of dealing with being treated subhuman or like half a citizen that the only thing you can think to do is post a statement about your anger and frustration on social media and then commit suicide in hopes that people will take notice and change. Deputy Floyd Kerr III of Lafayette Parish took his own life in that way because he was tired. He was frustrated. He was angry. The racism that he had encountered in his own life, even as a deputy in the, in the sheriff's office, the racism that his son had encountered was too much. The people that he had seen dying because of their color, their race. He was tired of his own mistreatment. And he had hoped, he had hoped that his suicide would spark change. I cannot imagine being that tired. I can't imagine being that frustrated and angry that that's the only thing I can think of to do. But here we see Jesus, frustrated, angry, perhaps tired of expecting change and not seeing any. You know, we, we've done an amazing job of taming Jesus, of domesticating him, making him into someone who, hey, Jesus, he's on our side. He's our personal savior. But in the process of claiming Jesus for our own personal benefit, we've lost the Jesus who joined with John the Baptist in this counter-cultural revolution, a revolution that sought to change the systems that oppressed, a revolution that was ushering in the kingdom of God, a revolution that wanted to turn economic systems onto their back, to flip the tables of oppression, poverty, hunger, and homelessness, 
Jesus wanted change. He lived his life to bring about change. He died to bring about change. So what was Jesus rebelling against in the temple? Well, as you know, or you may not, the temple in Jerusalem was considered to be the dwelling place of God. It was holy and sacred. The Jewish people, in fact, would travel long distances to get to the temple in Jerusalem so that they could celebrate Passover. And because they were traveling long distances, they couldn't bring their own animals for sacrifice. They arrived with currency from wherever they were traveling from. And so the temple, therefore, needed to provide certain conveniences. There needed to be money changers so that the currencies could be traded in for the temple currency. The currency that was needed to buy animals that were to be used in sacrifice. So this was common. So what is it that drove Jesus to this fit of rage? Why did he become so angry and frustrated that he had to resort to violence? Well, it was Passover. Jerusalem was overflowing with people, faithful to their tradition and to God, and they needed animals for sacrifice. So was Jesus angry that the sacrifice became so important that there needed to be this entire economy developed to support it? Or had, was he angry because the Passover had lost its significance? Or perhaps the religious trappings were superseding the actual purpose for the event? Or maybe the merchants were overcharging taking advantage of those who traveled far and had no choice but to exchange money at ridiculous rates or purchase doves and other animals at overinflated prices, gouging the faithful and making the temple a den of thieves. I don't know if we can say with any confidence what set Jesus off. One thing we can be sure of is that Jesus has just upset an extremely important day in the life of the temple and of the Jewish people. There would now be hundreds, maybe thousands, who were not going to be able to celebrate Passover because they couldn't get the preparations that they needed. Gail O'Day, in a commentary, writes that in driving all of these merchants out of the temple area, Jesus makes it impossible for pilgrims to make their Passover preparations. Jesus completely disrupts the mechanisms for celebrating Passover in the temple and enacts a very serious challenge to standard religious practices. He quotes, he quotes scripture to back up his actions. Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Imagine. Imagine that we have to travel to Raleigh, let's say, to celebrate Easter. And we bring our fancy clothes, but we don't have room for everything that we need. But that's okay, because when we get there, we can buy all the food we need. We can get peeps and baskets and Cadbury eggs. No problem. But when we get to Raleigh, a pastor from, I don't know, Elizabeth City has started a riot. The supermarkets are closed. All of the CDSs and Walgreens are shut down. Can't find a Kmart, a Walmart, Kmart. <laughs> Not even Amazon is delivering to Raleigh. It's a mess. So your Easter Sunday is ruined. Well, that's what Jesus has done. He has ruined Passover. I'm sure the people weren't happy. The temple authorities couldn't have been happy. The money changers and merchants definitely weren't happy. And Jesus may have just incited a riot. Now, this is not the Jesus we know. Or at least this is not the Jesus that we want. This Jesus is different. 
This Jesus is lashing out. He is a revolutionary. He's someone who wants to upend religious practice. Someone who wants to change economic systems, end oppression, make sure the sick are made well, the hungry are given food, the naked are clothed, and those without homes have a place to sleep and live. You see, Jesus is about equality and equity. Jesus sees a world where everyone is treated with dignity and compassion, where we all can eat and no one goes hungry. Do you know that approximately 370 million people in the world are in urgent need of food? 370 million. In this country, nearly 12% of Americans live in poverty. That's about 38 million people in this country living in poverty. More than 11 million children live in poverty. That's one of seven. One of every seven children lives in poverty. Children go to sleep hungry every night. Children go home to live in a car or a tent, not eating because schools are closed. No food at home. Not learning because they can't focus with an empty stomach. See, this is the kind of system that Jesus sought to overturn. A system where we make excuses for why those children don't eat. Well, their parents must be lazy. That's why they don't work. Don't they have other family that can take care of them? I've got children of my own to feed. It's not my job. But you see, it is our job. Yes, we do have our own to feed, but what of our neighbor? We say that we love our neighbor as ourself, as God loves us. So does that love permit us to look the other way, to say it's not our job? Does that love tell us that there's nothing we can do? It's too much, we'll never make a difference. I don't think it does. I mean, what, what about the people who work hard, have multiple jobs, minimum wage jobs, and they still can't afford rent or food? Recently, a young man called here, raising his son on his own, and he has to go to dialysis a couple of times a week. He can't work. He can't pay his bills. Why do we let that happen? What about the elderly who have to be, choose between food and medication? Are they our neighbors? Do we love them enough to bring about change? I think we do. You see, Jesus lived out his ministry helping people. He helped people who others ignored. He was chastised and judged for hanging out with tax collectors, prostitutes, terrorists, terrorists, zealots, right? They were terrorists. He hung out with lepers and those who were sick and infirm. Jesus walked this earth for them. Jesus lived his life to bring about change to right the injustices that were being placed upon those who were considered to be less than. See, Jesus came to bring about change that would usher in the kingdom, change that would bring about God's rule, a rule that would be fair, a rule where all would be equal and all would receive the same love and care. The apostles knew that. When Jesus died, we read in Acts that the community sold their belongings so that they could share amongst each other, so that all were taken care of. This is the world that Jesus was trying to bring about. It's a much different world than we live in. I know this is heavy, I'm sorry. 
We, we Christians, we take pride in our personal Savior who died for our sins. I think that's only partly true. Jesus certainly died for the sins of the people. And Jesus died because the people who ran the temple like a business or, or a legal authority, a government, he died for their sins. Their sins against him. Jesus died for the sins of the people who ran the empire and the cities and the countries. The people who hoarded the wealth and oppressed the poor, ensuring they never got out of poverty. Jesus died due to their sinful ways. It was their sins that killed Jesus. Jesus died because he saw who they were. He saw their selfishness and their greed. He saw the evil of the systems that they wanted to keep in place, and he spoke out. He tried to bring about change, and he did so knowing full well it would lead to his death. He knew that they weren't going to give up their power willingly. He knew they could not let him speak or live for very long. Too many people were following him. Too many people were seeing the truth and wanted change. But he continued. He continued to fight. He continued until the, sin, the sinful systems and the authorities ran those sinful systems became so afraid of change that they had no choice but to kill him. Those are the sins that killed Jesus. Those are the sins that he died for. So where is that Jesus today? Where is the Jesus who overturned the tables? The Jesus who questioned authority? The Jesus who upset the authorities so much that their fear of change drove them to kill him? Where is that Jesus? Well, Jesus is still here. He's here in each one of us. He's here in every person who is willing to stand up for change, willing to stand up for those who can't. Jesus continues to overturn tables, to upend religious norms, and to fight for the oppressed. He does this through each one of us. I love the expression that Christians are the followers of the way, the way of Jesus. We follow the way of Jesus. And if that's true, then where is the zeal for the house of God? It seems so many Christians are missing that zeal, that passion for bringing about the kingdom for helping their neighbor. Where is the willingness to stand up and fight for change? Change that will protect children and the poor. We have some of that willingness. We do many good things here. We understand. But not everyone does. Where's the willingness for the change that will ensure that we can all access adequate if not excellent health care. Change that will ensure that no one has to live on the street or in tents. Change that makes sure no one goes to bed hungry. Change that protects people like Jenna Franks. Change that lets everyone see her as a beautiful human being. Change that saves young black people from death at the hand of racism. Change that saves men like Floyd Kerr from the pressure and stress of racism. Pressure that drives a man to suicide. Will we stand for change that releases us all from fear of our neighbor and encourages us to embrace them? Do we have the zeal for that kind of change? See, I feel like Jesus has been watered down for us. His message softened and made more palatable. A message that allows us to be comfortable in the status quo allows us to say, well, you know, it's okay if I have extra, I worked for it, it's mine. Or, you know, or, or comfort to ignore what's going on around us. You know, we, we've created this Jesus who, 
just another person, really, with a message. But that wasn't Jesus. Jesus was a revolutionary. As I said earlier, this incident is at the beginning of his ministry. He didn't wait to get angry. He was angry when he started. He set out to upset the status quo. A status quo that still exists today. A status quo that still oppresses. But Jesus wasn't having any of it. And he's letting us know that it's okay to upset norms. It's okay to upend systems, to turn over a few tables once in a while. Because if the kingdom is to come, there needs to be change. Jesus died because there were those who were sinning against God and others by upholding evil and unjust systems. Those were the sins that he died for. And he died in an attempt to save us from those evils. He died trying to eliminate those sinful structures. But many of those sins still exist. The systems that Jesus tried to upend still exist. The systems are still evil and oppressive and unjust. Our post on social media this morning shares this image that is up on the, the TV screen. It's an image that's called Overturn. And the artist is Lyle Gwynn Garrity. And the artist writes this, in this image, I wanted to freeze frame the destruction Jesus ignites, forcing us as viewers to focus on the process of dismantling and destroying an oppressive system. For those who willingly or unwillingly benefit from systems of oppression, it may feel threatening and terrifying to see them all come tumbling down. But for those held within the unrelenting grip of injustice, it must be completely and utterly liberating. Again and again, Jesus shows us that his movement is about overturning systems of oppression to bring forth God's beloved community on earth. Again and again, liberation movements throughout history pursue the same goal. Will we join Jesus in the overturning or like the disciples question his methods? There's a sentence in there that, that really strikes me. Um, it hits me at home. Uh, for those who willingly or unwillingly, willingly or unwillingly, benefit from systems of oppression, it may feel threatening and terrifying to see them all come tumbling down. I always think about this thing. And who is making this thing? And who is harvesting the metals and things that make this thing? And how much they're getting paid and what I'm participating in a system of oppression, willingly. It's hard, right? It's hard not to. I mean, you know, we have to go live in the woods not to participate in systems of oppression. But we can change them. I know that as a congregation and as a community, we are committed to change. We're committed to those in need, the so-called least of these. We follow the way of Jesus. We seek ways to help the elderly and the poor and the hungry, but we can't let up. This is not the time to say we are doing enough. There is always, always more to do. And I commend you on your willingness to step out in faith and make changes that seek to welcome and affirm everyone. Let's think about what more we can do. I'm proud to be a part of this congregation that supports those in need with food and assistance. But we have to ask, what more can we do? I love that we welcome all races and cultures and that we seek a community that looks like the kingdom there is more we can do. This congregation cares for each other. Cares for each other when we are ill. We care for those who may be in the care of hospitals and institutions. 
We pray for those in need. And what more can we do? I encourage you to challenge the church, to challenge each other. Please challenge me to step out and turn over some tables. Share your ideas and concerns, and together let's see what more we can do. The status quo is not good enough. The systems that oppress need to be overturned. The kingdom is at hand, and Jesus has left the work in our hands. As I was writing this, I realized that as I get to the end, I've not even mentioned the, the series name for this week. Again and again, we are shown the way. Jesus has shown us the way. And Jesus continues to do so. So let's continue to follow the way of Jesus. Maybe so. At this time, we um, would normally take up our collection. We reflect, though, upon the good that we do as a community and the good that our generosity does to, to, to help this community and to further God's work. And as we move to communion, we think about that sacrifice, right? We think about the sacrifice that Jesus makes. And we reflect upon the sacrifices that we make. Communion hymn today is Alas and Did My Savior. participate in the new life that Christ gives.
missing the piece just isn't the same anymore, right? Um, I've been thinking lately that I've gotten to know many of you, you know, pretty well, you know, and I can't hug you, and, and you know, and I want to so many times, and so um, know that I'm hugging you always. Uh, so we take this time to to offer each other peace, to offer each other the peace of Christ, just as Jesus, when he appeared to his his disciples, he said, "Peace be with you." For the angels that appear to Mary, peace be with you. And so we take this time to offer the peace of Christ to each other. So may the peace of Christ be with you. Yeah. <laughs> so we have um, we have some opportunities coming up. Um, this Tuesday, and, and I don't know if I sent this out in the newsletter or not, but this Tuesday, um, the region is having a sort of a, um, an introductory meeting about putting together an event for educators, an online event that will um, offer educators some, some support. Um, it's an educator soul care event, if you will. Um, educators are really good at um, taking care of their students, not so good at taking care of themselves sometimes. I, I know this from experience. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there are things that people can do for self-care, but um, I think we have some responsibility to offer soul care, if you will. So um, on Tuesday, um, there is a, uh, a Zoom meeting at 6.30, and I will send out the information to that for anybody who wants to join. It is a regional thing, so don't feel like, you know, um, you must join it. It's... Um, Really voluntary. Uh, we also continue our book study this week. So on Wednesday, we will meet again at 6.30 to discuss the last week. Um, I think we are on chapter three or four. Two and three, three and four, something like that. Somewhere around three. Three and four. Okay, so somewhere around three, four, we think. Yeah, okay. Um, so please feel free to join us. The uh, information is on Facebook. Um, there'll be a newsletter that will have it or a quick blurb I'll send out um, so that everybody has the link. Uh, we also still have some of those supply kits for our houseless neighbors. They're sitting outside the, uh, my office and so um, if you want to pick one up uh, you can stop by or if you're here today you can take one with you. Good to have in your car in case you run across someone who's in need. So our closing hymn today is um, a song from The Many, and The Many are the group that has provided uh, most of the music uh, that goes along with this series that we're doing uh, again and again. So this is called Forgive Us uh, by The Many. Oh, we hope is that you're here. Hey.
I, w- I want you to know that um, recognize, and I, I feel blessed to be part of this community that does care for others so well and that does work for change. And so I want you to know that I'm not calling out this community in the sense that we are not doing enough, just that we can do more. And maybe, just maybe by our example, others will do more. And so I am um, thankful and grateful for all that you do for this community um, in this larger community. So this morning, as you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice, and may your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace, and may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and the love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen. A wonderful, wonderful Sunday. When you're not sure who you really are When all you feel is the shape of your scars And you have more wounds than you can count Open your eyes, look all around You aren't alone, this is your